the main topic I want to discuss today is all of the changes and adaptations and transitions we're going through in Canadian agriculture. And I want to start out by saying, you know, it's not only the farming community that's trying to transition to this new environment. It's also the grain companies, the railways, and even the egg buyers, the people that are buying the products from Canadian agriculture, they're trying to figure out, now what is this new system going to look like? There's still a lot of uncertainty. There's still obviously a lot of questions. People are working behind the scenes trying to get the details worked out. So this is an evolving process. And there's some things that I'm going to try and point out to you and draw some parallels to what's happening in the States to give you an idea of some of the things that we might be looking at in the near future. The main story is from here on forward, as farmers, as agriculture producers, you're going to be responsible for making your own marketing decisions for spring wheat, durum, and barley, both malt barley and feed barley. So what I want to talk a little bit, to start a little bit about is the volatility, the changes, the fluctuations we've been seeing in agricultural pricing in the last several years. And this is a graph showing the actual cash price received at Minot, North Dakota. Now Minot is located at about, if you take the about the border of Saskatchewan and Manitoba and go straight south into North Dakota, there's a large terminal elevator there that kind of tends to be the price setter for, for the region. And I, I have uh, fortunately been able to track the, the prices offered to farmers at the driveway for spring wheat, which is in the red bar, for durum, which is in the yellow bar, and for malt barley, which is the purple. Now, this goes back, actually, I have information going much, much later than this. But this particular graph starts in about 2000 and runs through about last week. So I want to point out what's happened since about 2007. If you look before 2007, look at the kind of volatility, the variability we had in prices as we move through time. And then look what's happened after that point. Pretty dramatic shift. And as I look forward, as I look at my crystal ball, I really don't expect the forces that are creating this volatility to change much as we move forward. There's going to be, there's been some substantial changes. Let me take this same information and present it a little bit differently. This is a graph showing the same information just for spring wheat. And all I did here was I plotted out what's the change in price from one week to the next. So instead of just looking at what is the price, what happened to the change in price from one week to the next? And again, we look at what happened in about that 2007, 6, 7 time period. There was a, before that, yes, we had prices bounced around. We had some variability. But since then, in comparative terms, it's been off the charts. Very, di very different marketing environment. And as you move forward in time, these are some things that we're going to have to be dealing with. Now, one volatility, having prices bouncing around is kind of a two-edged sword. When prices are moving higher, life is good. But when prices start taking a turn south, when they go lower, life can be very difficult. So what are some of the things you can do to be a better marketer? And, and again, as part of my job at the university, I do programs, um, educational programs for farmers. I also work some with agribusiness on understanding what's happening in the markets. How do you use the tools, the marketing tools that are available in our toolbox to make better management decisions? So my job is education. I'm here to try and help educate and teach people. So what are some of the things that I talk about with our North Dakota farmers? Well, one of the things when I do Outlook, when I talk about the, the forces, just like the previous speaker, when I talk about the forces that are impacting the marketplace, inevitably there's somebody that comes up at the end of the, of the presentation and says, look, if you could just tell me when the highest price of the year is going to be reached, I'll just sell it then. Well, my question to you, and, and hopefully you can answer this, so how many times during the year is the highest price achieved? Once, right? So what are the odds you're actually going to hit that one day when prices peak out? Not very good odds, is there? And I tell you, to be very honest with you, I can't do that. I don't think anybody can do that, especially consistently. So how do we deal with this volatility? How do we deal with this new, new marketing environment? There's four things that I really want to point out, okay? And I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit more detail as we move through. The first is you've got to decide what's a good price. At what point do you think the prices that are quoted are saying, that's a good price, I want to lock something in. You've got to, you've got to have a target in mind. So how do you determine a target? 
The first thing you got to know is your cost of production. And I know marketing people have been talking about this for the last 50 years and farmers have been kind of ignoring it, but it's becoming more and more and more important to understand your cost of production because that cost of production is increasing very rapidly. And what I'm suggesting is use that cost of production as a base and you say, what kind of rate of return or what kind of margin am I going to shoot for? And when those levels are reached, let's try and sell something. The second is to make sequential sales. And again, I can't, if I could pick the top and sell everything on that one day, that'd be fantastic. But again, the odds of doing that are very, very low. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the strategies we can use for free plant, trying to decide how many acres to produce, free harvest, basically right now during the growing season, once we have a better idea of kind of what kind of crop we've got coming on, there might be some pricing opportunities. And then what do you do after harvest? What are some of the different tools we can use in those different time periods? Make, make time, don't just take time, but make time to understand what's going on. Okay, the markets are changing very, very quickly. It's not that you have to sit down and watch every ticker on the futures market to try and figure out what's going on. You don't have to spend all the time every day doing this, but you have to be consistent and spend a little bit of time on a regular basis understanding what's going on. And I'll tell you some of the information sources you might be able to use. And then finally, understanding what are the tools we have in our toolbox and how do you use those tools. And more importantly, when do you use those tools? So let me talk about this cost of production thing. This is the price that's quoted for wheat delivered to Minot for the crop that hasn't been harvested yet. Okay, the, the local elevator posts a price saying, okay, if you want a forward contract spring wheat for delivery at harvest, what price will we offer? And I want to point out one thing. Notice when this price series starts. It actually starts in 2011, in October. So just after the harvest, the elevator starts quoting prices for the crop that hasn't been planted yet. Okay? And again, this goes through about the middle of last week. The red line on bottom is the cost of production per bushel. Now this is put together by some colleagues of mine at the university to try and estimate the cost of producing different crops for the upcoming year. And I took that and divided it out by the acres to try and get a cost per acre. What I'm suggesting is if you look at that chart, you're saying, you know what? In today's environment, prices are high enough, we'll cover our costs. The key to that is that red line on the bottom for cost of production does not include any return to you as a farmer. You're not getting, you're paying everybody else first. Okay? You have not paid yourself for your own time, your own management, and the time and effort you put into making that crop grow. So what rate of return are you looking for? What kind of a profit margin are you targeting? And this is really the way that um, agribusiness thinks about things. When they make an investment in a new enterprise, when they're trying to decide how much different products to produce, they're looking at saying, look, if this product line can't provide a rate of return, let's say 20% on, on our costs, we're not going to do it. And in, in, corporate, in corporate world, 20, 25% is a very common number. What I did was I took this cost of production and I added 15%. That's the blue line on top. So if you're looking at a 15% rate of return, which is really pretty typical in agriculture, if you look at it over the long haul, it's about, in, in dollars, that's about $35 an acre, give or take a little. How many times during the last 12 months, not quite 12 months, has there been an opportunity to price at a 15% rate of return or better? Only a couple, right? So if you were to look at that and you say, well, look, there was definitely a pricing opportunity here. If you're saying my target is to get 15% rate of return, about $35 an acre, I'm comfortable with that. If that price is reached, you better be selling something. It's a pretty simple process. So what about making sequential sales? Let me go back one. If you notice, there were some opportunities here periodically, right? You're never going to hit the home run ball. Don't try and sell your whole crop at once. And if it's trying to forward contract something, of course, you don't want a foreign contract too heavily. So you really need to be looking at making sequential sales because a big part of marketing is also risk management. 
You know, we'd love to be able to hit the high, but definitely want to avoid the lows, right? Making smaller sales more often is one strategy for managing risk. Now, there's other things in our toolbox we have for risk management, but that's one very simple, straightforward way of accomplishing that. And again, we've got some time periods before you plant, trying to decide how many acres or what crop to grow. You've got some times right now, if we have some, some kind of a weather scare, and it looks like there's some weather scare building into the corn market, which is going to pull the wheat up as well, there might be some pricing opportunities in the near future. And then finally, of course, post-harvest. What happens after, the, after we've harvested, do we know how many bushels we're dealing with? But again, making sequential sales means what? You've got to pay attention to what's happening. Where do you get the information to do this? Again, I'm promoting the fact you need to spend a little bit of time on a regular basis, preferably every day, to try and follow what's happening. And you will learn a lot by listening. One of the best places, to be very honest with you, is the local media. The agricultural press does a fantastic job of talking about what are the current issues. What are the things that are impacting the markets? What's the daily market report? You can listen to that on the radio. You can get that on your iPhone or iPad. There's ways you can access this, but you have to spend a little bit of time studying what's going on. There's also public information. Agriculture Canada, StatsCan, as well as USDA puts out reports on a regular basis updating what their projections and forecasts are for the future. Now, we always take some shots and criticisms at government agencies for the kind of material they put out, but they're still a reliable source. They're an independent source of what's happening. The other one, of course, is private marketing services, and there's a lot of both private marketing services available locally as well as the large national ones that you can go to that, again, will help provide some information. Some of them will give marketing advice. My, you know, my caution is most of those do a very, very good job, but there's a few of them out there you've got to be careful of because some of them are not as reputable as others. Okay. There's two main things that are going on. Supply demand conditions are something we understand. Okay, so what happens, what do you think is going to happen to prices if we have a short corn crop in the United States? Or if the soybean crop in the United States is going to be a bit smaller than we expect, if yields are hurt by heat and dry weather, what's going to happen to canola prices? They'll go up. What happens if there's all of a sudden, um, let's say, a drought in the uh, Black Sea region in Russia? What do you think is going to happen to the price of wheat? It's going to go up because our export competition is, 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 is diminished. Supply demand stuff we understand. It's what's happening in the financial community that's a new addition to markets and a new addition to what's happening within agriculture. Because there are now the investment community is using agricultural commodities as part of their portfolio. So sometimes what happens is they'll come in and buy or sell their positions in agricultural commodities not necessarily based on what's happening in agriculture, but what's happening in the investment community. So that has added a completely different dimension and makes, makes things a little bit more difficult. I just want to point to supply demand conditions. This is a chart of world production and use. And again, one of the things I'm going to point out is wheat, in particular, is a bit different because it is truly a world commodity. The red line up there is total uh, uh, use. On the world stage, the green line is total production on the world stage. The blue bars on the bottom are stocks to use. How much do we have in reserve as a percent of our total usage? How much do we have in reserve in case we have a production problem some way? Well, remember I, I talked about the increase in volatility we've seen in prices since about 2007? Guess when we had the low in world wheat stocks? 2007. There's some things, some st substantial things that changed and occurred at that time in those time periods. I also want to throw this up because one of the questions I get from some farmers in, on the Canadian side is, so why is marketing wheat so much different than marketing canola? We understand how to market canola. We've got a futures market for it. We've been doing this for a long time. Well, there is a difference. As I said earlier, wheat is one of those truly world commodities. When you look at the amount of bushels that are exported, if you, and this is kind of a proxy for world trade, the green on line on top is the amount of bushels that are exported in the world market for wheat. The red line is corn exports, the amount of, of corn trade in the world market. The blue line is soybean trade. 
and the black line on the bottom is canola. The thing I want you to realize is wheat is truly a world commodity. There's a lot of different parts of the world produce wheat, a lot of different parts of the world consume wheat, and there's a lot of trade that goes on. And so the dynamics in the wheat market are going to be different than they are in the canola market. And you have to understand that. How do we use up the wheat in the United States? And this is a chart that shows very quickly. In the United States, we produce a lot of wheat, we export a lot of wheat. And some of the classes, in particular spring wheat, we compete with Canadian producer for wheat, right? In the U.S., the green line that runs through the middle of the graph that's fairly stable, that's the amount of wheat that goes into domestic consumption, basically the milling industry. Okay, wheat that's, that's produced and goes into milling. And you can see that's relatively flat, it's rel relatively stable. So whether prices are high or prices are low, the domestic, U.S. domestic wheat milling market produce, buys about the same amount. The blue line towards the bottom is feed usage. We don't use a lot of feed as uh, a lot of wheat as feed in the United States because corn is our dominant feed usage. But we do some, and it's typically the off-grade stuff, the low quality, some sprout damage or has some issues with it. And of course, we always hold some back for seed. The one note I want you to focus on, though, is that black line that bounces around a lot. That's the amount we export. So in the United States, if there's a if there's a strong world demand for wheat and we're able to meet that demand and have our export sales are high, we have really strong prices. If the export market is very cluttered, if we have a lot of competition on the international front, we're having a hard time selling the international market, wheat prices in the United States suffer because of that. Here's the same information for Canada. Now this is all wheat combined, so this would be spring wheat, Durham, and a little bit of, the, little bit of winter wheat that you guys grow, okay? The, again, the black line is exports. The green line is domestic consumption for milling in Canada. The blue line is feed. In the United States, again, it bounces around a little bit, but about 45 to 50 percent of our production goes into the export market, depending on the year. In Canada, it's approximately 70 percent. So Canadian wheat is much more dependent about what happens internationally than we are in the U.S. The one thing you will notice, though, is that your exports, the amount you export, tends to be a bit more stable in the, in the States. Ours bounces around a lot. You're able to market some in the international market much more consistently than we are. Okay? What I'm trying to get at, though, is the dynamics in the wheat market are different than the dynamics in the canola market. There's a lot of similarities. Some of the tools you're using to market your canola will also work for spring wheat. Okay? But there are some differences, and one of them is this large export demand for, for wheat. Okay? And we need to, to account for that. So what are some of the marketing tools we can use? And this is just kind of a laundry list. The top one up there, if you're looking at trying to decide what to plant before springs work, you're trying to say, well, how many acres of what do I plant? Now, I understand a lot of, time, a lot of your um, acreage decisions are based on rotation what kind of land you've got, what kind of fertility management, what kind of weed problems you have, you have disease problems. I understand that. But you always have some acres you can flip around. You always have some acres, well, depending on what's going on, it could increase or decrease this, right? So what do you do on the margin? Cash forward contracts is a very straightforward way of doing that. And in certain market environments, that's a fantastic way to do to market your grain. But we have more tools in our toolbox, okay? The next two, this hedge to arrive contract, basis contracts, those are things you can sign with your local elevator or local processor. Those are contracts that they offer that allow you some flexibility in how you price your crop. These bottom ones, selling futures contract or buying options, those are things that you need to do work with a broker on. And one of the messages I'm trying to send is these contracts up here that you can sign with your local elevator will do essentially the identical thing as working with a broker. So you as, a, as an individual farmer have a choice. You can work with the elevator and sign a contract for, with them or you can work with a broker and do it independently. The marketing strategies essentially work identical but the mechanisms, the mechanics of how you do that change a bit. One of the things that I want to focus on and emphasize is at least in the states when you're doing a forward contract, just a straightforward price contract for wheat whether it be spring wheat or durum or even, even barley, most of those do not have act of God clauses. 
There's a few of the, mark, of the malt barley contracts that do, but most do not, which means that if you sign up and say, well, I want to, I'm going to sell you 15,000 bushels of, of Durham, you're required to deliver 15,000 15, bushels of, of Durham. And if you come up short, you're going to have to have a discussion with the buyer and say, okay, how do we work this out? Okay, that's the common practice in the U.S. So from a pre-plant standpoint, of course, you don't want to get too far ahead. You don't want to pre-price too many bushels and make sure that you can deliver those. Okay, how about pre-harvest? If you notice, I flipped my slide. There was pre-plant, there's pre-harvest. The tools are essentially the same. I and mean, if you're going to try and price some grain today for a crop you haven't grown yet, you got the same set of tools. The dynamics are a little bit different because you now you have a better idea of how many bushels you might produce. Right? You've got a better idea what your potential yields are. Post-harvest. After you've harvested, you know how many bushels you're dealing with. You do have a few more things in your toolbox. And notice the bottom ones are identical. The top ones, the top two ones, sell at harvest, just sell directly off the combine. And there's years that's actually a pretty good strategy. I don't know if I do it on a regular basis because why? When are typically the lowest prices of the year? Right at harvest. Now there's a few exceptions to the rule, but most of the time, you know, sometimes you have to do it because you got storage limitations, but that's typically not the best time to be selling your grain. Another one, of course, is just put it in a bin and wait. And there are times where that strategy is a fantastic strategy to use. It's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't work consistently. And potentially you might be leaving some money on the table, and I'll show you some reasons in a minute here. Flash this up very, very quickly. I just want to show this that there are some tools out there. This is a little matrix that was put together. It's a way of thinking about which tools work best in what marketing environments. Okay, and it just forces you to think about where does this thing work? How does this work? So if you think the futures price is going to go up, you look at these top two quadrants. If you think the futures price is going to go down, you look at the bottom two. The next question is, do you think the basis or that differential between cash and futures is going to get wider or narrower? Okay, so if you think the spread is pretty wide right now and it'll narrow up, you look on the left hand side because those are the tools that work best. If you think they're really narrow like this and it may go like that, then you look on the right hand side. And, and this was put together by a professor out of uh, Michigan State University. It's been around for quite a while. And I think this is a fantastic way of deciding and choosing which tool works best in what environments. Let me just point out one real quick example here. Basis contract. Anybody signed a basis contract for canola? Have you tried that before? Sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't work so hot. What I'm getting at is, you know what? Based on these, this matrix here, the basis contract works really well if you think the futures price is going to go up a lot faster than the cash price. You know, all these nasty investment funds are going to come in and drive the futures market up, but the cash market is going to kind of lag behind. Basis contract works fantastic in that environment. But if you're over here, it doesn't work at all. In fact, you're definitely leaving money on the table. So it's, it, the analogy or the example I like to use is like fixing your combine. You got a toolbox that you can fix your combine in the field, right? You got lots of tools in there. One of the most flexible tools you have is what? A crescent wrench, right? You can do a lot of stuff with a crescent wrench if you need to. In fact, you can even use it as a hammer once in a while if, it, if you're in a pinch. But it doesn't make a very good screwdriver. Picking the right tool at the right time can really add to your bottom line. Okay, role of the futures market. Now, I, I want to say, and, and I'm, I'm going to mention this at the very end, I've shared all of this stuff with the folks at APAS. So if you want to copy the presentation, you can download it, you can look at it. I've got my contact information. You've got any questions, you're driving home and you say, what did that crazy guy from North Dakota talk about? You know, send me an email or something, I'll try and explain it to you, okay? So, what are the role of the futures market? I want to go through this, again, I don't have time to explain this in gory detail, but I want you to be thinking about some of the things that, that, that I'm, I'm trying to pose to you here. There's two main reasons that the futures market exists, the why they're an advantage to you as a farmer. We have a lot of commodities that don't have futures markets. I mean, field peas, lentils, flax, 
you know, we've got active markets in those commodities, right? So why is a futures market required? Or why is it so important? Well, there's, it, it does two very important things. First, it helps with price discovery. So one of the questions I get once in a while is, so what is the price quote at the local elevator a fair price? You know, is, is, is somehow some information getting, getting lost? Well, if I ask somebody, what's the price of corn, where would you go to look up the price of corn? The quickest place to find that is look at the futures market in Chicago, right? That's a common reference point to say, well, how does that price compare to what I'm getting locally? And if there's a sudden, you know, if, if the futures price for corn goes up 30 cents and the local price goes up 10 cents, what's going on? Can, can, the, can the local manager explain why that differential is appearing, right? So price discovery is really important. The other one is risk transfer. And as farmers, one of the, there's going to be two different times you're going to be looking at this and saying, well, there's times I want to shed risk. Basically asking the question, do, if you see the price you have today, I want to lock that in. How do I do that? You're going to be hedging. If you want to try and use the futures market to enhance price, to get a better price, you're going to have to do some speculating. Now, the market needs both of those people to be effective. Some, of, some people point to these speculators and say, well, these are nasty guys, but guess what? We really need them as part of this. Can anybody tell me, well, I, I gave you the answer here, there's multiple markets for wheat in the United States. The major markets for wheat, Chicago Board of Trade. Chicago Board of Trade trans, um, sells contracts, futures contracts, for soft red winter wheat. It's our largest and most liquid wheat market. As of uh, Wednesday, or no, this is Thursday, as of yesterday, there were 63, almost 64,000 contracts traded in one day for Chicago soft red winter wheat. In one day. And that was just the July contract. That's not the entire market, that's just the July contract. In Kansas City, we also have another one, Kansas City Board of Trade. That is a futures market for hard red winter wheat. Two days ago, they, they exchanged about 15,000 contracts just on the July contract, okay? We also have the Minneapolis Grain Exchange. That trades hard red spring wheat, very comparable to your Canadian red, uh, Western red, okay? Very comparable in quality and characteristics. About 15,000, about 14,000 contracts in one day. Can anybody tell me there's a futures market for wheat in Canada now? You guys are aware of that? The ice exchange in Winnipeg, which trades canola, started trading both a spring wheat as well as a Durham contract, and they modified their, their barley contract a couple months ago. Anybody tell me how many contracts were traded for spring wheat were traded in the last couple days on the ice exchange? Zero. So uh, now I suspect that as we move forward in time, the, the Canadian, uh, and I'm really, really hoping the Durham market, the futures market for Durham takes off and does some things. We'll probably see some more trading as, you know, after August 1, once the, the wheat board is done, the old wheat board is done with their central desk selling, okay? But I caution people that if you're going to use the ICE exchange, be very, very careful about liquidity. Because if you go in and want to buy or sell a contract, you want to have somebody on the other end. This is not very optimistic. The other thing that was started just a few months ago was ICE US, okay? out of New York, started trading a soft red winter wheat contract that competes with the Chicago one. But as you can see, their contract traded was much, much less than what happened in Chicago. Can anybody tell me what basis is? Technically, and, and this is the, the simplest definition, it's the difference between your local cash price and the futures price. Okay, so cash and futures, they tend to move up and down together. I mean, when you hear on the radio that Again, the futures price went up, well, for canola, futures price went up, you know, $15 a ton. You'd expect your cash price to come up too. But they never go up and down perfectly. And that differential, the difference between the futures price and what you get at your local processor or local elevator is called the basis. 
the key word there is local. Okay, the key word is local. So the basis here in Regina is different than the basis in Moose Jaw, which is different than the basis in Saskatoon, which is different from Swift Current, right? Each of those local markets have their own little dynamics. So one of the advantages we have is that cash and futures work together. That's why these contracts, these more hybrid contracts that are futures based work. They give you a lot of flexibility and you can shift your risk. But they don't move together exactly the same because they don't have the same participants. The classic example, the one I like to use is, you know, we don't have hedge fund traders coming into the cash market and buying spring wheat or buying canola. They'll buy the futures contract, buy and sell those because they can get in and out very quickly. But they don't trade in the cash side. Okay? We also have a whole bunch of farmers that are trading in the cash market that aren't necessarily doing anything in futures market. The other thing I want to point out is one of the reasons that they, that doesn't move perfectly, the relationships aren't perfect, is they don't respond to new information at the same rate. Okay, so for example, if there's a crisis in the European debt situation, the futures market's going to crash and crash very hard. But that doesn't mean that the cash market is going to crash as hard. Or vice versa, if there's some really optimistic news out there, if suddenly you know, everybody gets into agricultural commodities and the futures price goes up wild, the cash market, let's say there's a rumor that the, um, the Russian grain or the Russian crop is in serious shape. Futures market can rally very, very quickly, right? On the expectation that they're going to have a short crop because the weather forecasts are saying, you know, it's going to get hot and dry. Well, the cash market may wait a little bit and say, well, wait a minute, we're going to wait to see if this really develops. So sometimes the futures market over responds to information. And again, they don't move perfectly together. The spread is called the basis. So what I did just to show you is I plotted out over time what's happened to the basis. And again, this is for Minot because I have the information for it. Now, when would you, what time of year would you expect basis, the spread between cash and futures, to be widest at harvest? Why is that? Exactly. More people want to deliver into the cash market than the cash market can handle. Okay? So the futures market is bouncing around here and the cash market is going down. Why? Because the cash market is saying, wait a minute, we're getting more grain than we can handle right now. In fact, a lot of times what happens is they keep lowering the price until you guys quit delivering. They're saying, whoa, you know, we, we put it in a bin someplace, we'll need it later. We don't need it right now. So when is the difference, the spread, the basis, the narrowest? When is that spread, the differential, usually, what time of year, the narrowest? Pardon? It can be around seeding. That's a very good answer. A lot, because you guys are busy in the field, the last thing you want to do is haul grain, right? This red line right here that I have in 2004 and 5 is a very, it's right out of the textbook, very classic kind of a, you get a low there and it starts to come up and then it starts to drop down, kind of an S shape, right? So when does that start peaking out? January, February, right? Why is that? Pardon? Nobody wants to haul grain in January and February, right? I mean, it's colder and blazes out. You can't get the tractor started. You can't get the truck started. You've got to spend half a day blowing snow to even get to the bins. The cash market's got to work pretty hard to get you excited about hauling grain in the middle of winter, right? It's not a lot of fun. So we can take advantage of this pattern. Now, what I'm going to argue is the pattern has shifted. This is the old days. Remember I talked about kind of market prices volley, bouncing around in the early 2000s, and all of a sudden after that, in the late 2000s, things went nuts? The same thing has happened with basis. So let me flip back one. This is the old days. This is what we've seen the last several years. Okay, let me go back to this 2004 and 5. If you look at the difference between the low of the year and the high of the year, we're looking at somewhere about what about uh, 30 cents under. Okay, in in at harvest versus about what 10 cents over. So that's about a 40 cent range. Okay, now let's look at uh, 2010, 11. This green line. We had a low of about a dollar twenty-five under, and by the time we hit springs work, we had about a dollar twenty-five over. That's a three-dollar spread. 
we went from about 40 cents within a year to three dollars. Now depending upon which marketing tool you use, you're either capturing some of that or you're leaving some of that on the table. In the old days, it didn't make a whole lot of difference. In today's environment, we got to be watching basis also. That spread, the relationship between cash and futures. What changed to drive the, volat the volatility in the basis? In all of it? Okay. <sighs> How much time do you have? <laughs> no, there's, there's really, a, there's kind of a combination of three things that happened at about the same time. Okay. In, in that 2007 time period, early 2007, we got into a very short crop situation worldwide. Short crop for wheat, short crop for corn, and beans, you know, it wasn't really a, a disastrous year, but we we're a bit tight on beans as well. So the three major commodities that we trade in North America here, all were tight. We had strong world demand, economies were growing. This was before the big financial crisis, you know, in the States, right? There was gr huge growth potential. The other thing, so there was, a, there was a actually a supply demand situation. The other thing that happened was, is about that time period that most of the major commodity exchanges, Chicago Board of Trade, Kansas City, Minneapolis, shifted to electronic trading. They went from pit trading to pit trading and electronic trading. It was also about late 2006 into 2007, a little company called Goldman Sachs released a report to their inv investing community and said, you know what, we've been looking at, at these trends for the last, over the last 80 years, and we noticed that when the economy is like this, commodity prices are, tend to be like this. When the economy goes like this, the co commodities tend to go like that. So they're really nice for diversifying. And then in 2008, what happened? We started getting into this financial crisis. Everybody started bailing out of the traditional financial investments. They looked around and said, now where do we stick our money? Ooh, commodities, agriculture, energy, like crude oil, natural gas, okay, became very attractive. So they went to electronic trading, which meant the guy could, in New York could sit on his computer and start buying and selling and trading ag commodities, as well as you know, the, the, the precious metals and the energies and all this other stuff. I don't think we'll go back to the old world. We're not going to go back to pit trading anymore. We're going to have electronic trading from now on. The finance community has found out that investing in commodities, and ag commodities in particular, make a very good diversification tool. And you know what? So far we haven't had major production around the world to really rebuild stocks. Demand continues to grow. So there's kind of a culmination of things that occurred at that time. And here's where we are now. Again, the red line, we came down from these highs. We kind of blast here because we had a big crop. You know, things stabilized a little bit. Okay, I gotta be very careful with my time. What about grain quality? Because that's the other big difference between canola and spring wheat. Right? How many, how much your grade, how much your canola goes grade one? 99%. The only time you might have a problem is if you get frost and your green cone goes up, right? A very different world in the spring wheat area. And I'll talk about what's going on in the states when it comes to quality in a, in a little bit. One of the things you got to understand is in the U.S. we price things a little bit differently. By the time you work through the system, the prices you receive and the prices we receive are very similar. The bar, but the process we use to get there is a bit different. So in the states, we start with a base price for a kind of a standard quality. And we adjust up and down from that based on what kind of quality standards you've got. But we take each of those individually. So the premiums and discounts, again, those are usually standardized, but, I mean, the, the quality characteristics, excuse me, but the actual premium and discount, the, the price adjustments, are applied at the time of delivery. You can't lock those in. So you as a farmer are exposed to that risk. And there's some years where the discounts for off-grade or off-quality stuff are going to be very small. And there's other years where it's going to be very, very big. And I'll show you some charts in just a second. And again, they vary over time. So I talked about the volatility going on in basis, the volatility going on in base price. We're seeing a lot of volatility now in these premiums and discounts. 
This is kind of a standard set of, of, of base quality characteristics for U.S. spring wheat. Our base is 14% protein, and it goes up or down from there. If you get higher protein, you get a premium. If you get lower protein, you get some discounts. Test weight at 60 pounds. Notice that there's only a discount. There's no premium. If you, if you got 62 pound wheat, there's no premium for it. Now granted, technically you got more bushels because of the math you used to get, right? Because of the test weight. But if you get really low test weight, you're going to get discounted for it, okay? Uh, foreign matter, that would be like rocks and stones and glass and all this other miscellaneous stuff that ends up. Um, damage kernels would be heat damage if, you, if your, your bin gets hot and you've got some problems or if there's some, let's say, some tombstone or, or fusarium or head blight, if you've got some problems that way, that'll be counted as damage. Falling numbers, that's one thing that we have in the States that I don't think is as common up here in Canada. Anybody understand falling numbers? It's really an, it's a, it's a measure of sprout damage. And your, your wheat can be damaged from excessive rains without having a physical sprout. And what it does is it messes up things for the millers, the wheat millers. It really degrades the quality of the flour. So they test for that. And if the falling numbers go below 300, you're going to get some discounts for it. Now, some of the really picky guys will go to 350. Let's say if it falls below 350, and again, the bigger the number, the better. So if it's the smaller the number, the worse it is. The smaller the number, the worse the sprout damage. Okay? Um, vomitoxin or dawn levels, you know, this is part of the scab issue, right? Uh, two parts per million is our break point. If you get less than that, you're fine. If you get more than two parts per million, you're going to start getting discounts. So, Frank, do, do they do falling numbers in elevators? Do they do falling numbers in elevators? No. Right now, they don't have a good driveway test for falling numbers. So, they do take a sample, send it off to a chemistry or to a lab to get tested. Moisture, of course, you under, all understand moisture and drying charges and that kind of stuff. So th there's a lot of similarities here. The point I want to make is this stuff's cumulative. So let's say you had some, um, some, some, head, some tombstone. You had some, uh, some um, fusarium head blade, right? So you're going to get some damaged kernels in there. They're going to discount you for that. And if you have vomitoxin on top of it, they're going to discount you a second time. So these things add on top of each other. Let's talk about protein, because that's been a very, very hot topic in the States the last couple years. What I, and, and again, I noticed 14% was our base. So you get a premium if you get above that or a discount below that. Now, it's really hard to get good information at the elevator level on what these proteins and discounts are, right? The, the premiums and discounts. So I took it at an export terminal. And this is some stuff that USDA collects so I had access to the information. All I did was I plotted out this, the price spread for 13, 14, and 15 protein wheat delivered to an export terminal. Okay? And these track very closely to local cash prices at the farm level. So the blue line on top is the premium you get for 15 pro. Okay, so if you're delivered to 15 instead of 14, that's the premium you get. If the green line on the bottom is the discount you get for 13 instead of 14. Okay? Now what do you see on that chart? What's the first thing you notice? They open and close together, don't they? The premiums and discounts kind of follow each other. They're very, very close to each other. The other thing you'll notice is we have long stretches of time in here where there's almost no premium and almost no discount. What is that telling you? We had a lot of 14 pro wheat. Then all of a sudden we run into some time periods like this 2005 time period or these last couple of years, 2009 to 2011, well, all of a sudden things went berserk. What, ha what is that telling you? We probably had a lot of low protein wheat. So we went from situations where we had almost no premium discount to areas where we had a $1.50 premium and about a $2 discount. That's serious money. When you start taking $2 off your base price because you don't have good enough protein, that gets your attention versus you know 10 cents. So I'm going to take the same information and convert it to a marketing year basis. So this, this first, first graph whoop, was just looking at it over time. If you convert that and say, what happened each marketing year? Now, the marketing year for wheat starts about harvest or just before harvest. And in the States, we use June 1. Why June 1? 
We got a lot of winter wheat. We're almost done with winter wheat harvest. Okay, you guys don't have much winter wheat, you got spring wheat, so your harvest is a little bit different. But the moral is, and I know this is a really ugly graph, so I'm going to clean it up a little bit. This is just the last several years. These are the years we have these big, big price swings. Notice what happened on the green line, which is 2008. We came just before spring wheat harvest, came in at about 10 cents under. All of a sudden we hit harvest and boom, it dropped very, very quickly and it bounced around for a while. And we came to the next year, all of a sudden, boom, about that September time period, it dropped again. We had a little recovery, but then it started drifting lower into 2010. Then we get into 2011, which is the red line, and all of a sudden it pops back up. We go from a $1.80 discount to about $0.20 cent discount. And then we had, we've had some drifting lower ever since. What's going on in that time period? I already told you the answer if you're listening carefully. What's usually happening at the time, time of year when we've got these big shifts going on? Harvest. August, September, that's kind of our normal spring wheat harvest, right? So what's happening is the market is adjusting. Once we get an idea of what the protein levels are coming in from the field, the market adjusts very quickly to that information. Okay, so let's look at the premiums. Almost identical, just mirror images of each other, right? Again, where all the action happens right around harvest, this time period here. So let me ask a question. Why is this important? Well, let's say that you had some 2011 grain still left in the bin, and it's sitting here at $1.60 per bushel premium. Okay, and you're saying, you know what? I'm going to hold out for a little bit better price. I'm going to wait until after harvest, thinking it might go higher. Well, all of a sudden, we get a whole bunch of good protein coming in and harvest, and it goes from $1.60 premium to about zero. Oops. That's price risk management, isn't it? We've got to be thinking about what this does to us. You've just lost essentially a buck sixty a bushel because you've marketed at the wrong time. Again, that's very serious money. That's my end of my presentation formally. And I want to leave some time for you to be able to talk about things. There's my contact information. And again, the, the folks at APAS have been generous enough to be able to post this information. So if you want to look at it and review it, I, I know that they're going to be video recording this. So if you want to listen to my presentation later on and say again, what's that crazy guy from North Dakota talking about? You got any questions? I'd be happy to try and answer some questions. OK, so the question was, let's, let's assume that you had a bunch of low protein weight in the bin. Okay, and, and, and okay, so what are some of the key things that might influence that premium or discount? You know, what would you do from a marketing standpoint? When's the best time to try and sell that really low protein stuff? <clears throat> what I've done, in, in, well, I've got some other, some other charts that I, I can show you, but what I've done is tried to, to come up with what are the things we need to watch? What are the main determinants of that spread? When is it really narrow and when is it really wide? And what I found out is that if the wheat crop, in, in, in particular in the western portions of North Dakota, eastern Montana, so basically your, your growing region south, if that region has very good protein, has good high, a lot of 15, 16 protein wheat, the protein spreads are about zero. If those guys have a big crop, high yields, lower protein, those widen out. So one of the things that I tell farmers, if you're trying to figure out what's going to happen to those protein, the premiums and discounts for protein, watch what's happening in, that, in the western growing region. If they have some, some hotter, warmer conditions, growing conditions late in the season, as that head is filling, is pollinating and filling, like chances are there's going to be a lot of good protein around, which means what? The premiums and discounts are going to be about zero. Now if those guys have a cool fall and they've got big yields coming, big test weights, proteins are going to be lower, those things are going to widen out. So what you're gambling on, if you've got very low protein wheat and the discounts are like 60 cents under and you're hoping that they go to 20 cents under, what you're really hoping for is a warm, dry production season so that you have a lot of high protein wheat so that they have some really good protein stuff they can blend off with your lower protein stuff. The, the, during harvest, and that's, that's the moral of the story here, is the shift, that rapid change occurs typically as we start harvest, as the, as the market, as the, as the grain buyers start to get the reports in saying, well, what's this quality of this new crop look like? 
and they start to see a lot of low protein stuff coming in, they get a little bit nervous and those, those margins start to widen out again. If they hear that, that there's a lot of high protein wheat, you know, then, they're not, then they're comfortable, they're fine, saying, oh, well, we don't have to bid very hard to get this really high protein wheat to flow. And, and, and you know, the quality of the winter wheat crop in the States also makes a difference. I mean, winter wheat tends to be lower protein anyway. So you take the higher protein spring wheat, you blend it with the lower protein winter wheat to get the kinds of bread qualities you need. Okay. So the, the moral is, yeah, it's not only a matter of you know, following what's going on with basic prices, what's happening in the futures market, what's happening locally, but then you have all these quality issues, which makes marketing wheat a bit more complex than the crops are used to. So the comment was that, that yes, that, that in, in, today, in the new environment, you, when you're contracting, you have to be very careful about are you, are you contracting for number ones, are you contracting for number twos, what ha might happen to those spreads, you know, what happens if I contract number one and I deliver number two? You know, what, what happens? The, the contract itself should, should specify that or explain what's going to happen if that occurs. Now, again, that's the, the, the system we have in the United States is a little bit different. The, the mechanics of how we do this is a little bit different than what you've seen in Canada. And, and I suspect that, again, at the end of the day, you come to a price that's about the same. It's just the process you use to get there. But read the contract very carefully to say, what are you agreeing to deliver? What, what quality care, what's, what's the quality specs, and what happens if I don't deliver that? If I deliver better than that, you know, I should get some kind of premium for it, but if I deliver less, now what? So again, be asked, reading it, understand it, ask a lot of questions. Don't be scared to ask questions. And, and to be very honest, the grain buyer is just as concerned that you understand what's going on as you are, because they don't want to have this battle. They don't want to have a disgruntled farmer. The last thing they want to have is a bunch of public relations problems, right? You know, nobody likes somebody jumping on their desk and screaming up and down because they weren't treated fairly. So they want you to understand what's happening too. They're not trying to you know, con you into something, okay?